When it was evening, on that day, the first day of the week, the disciples were in a room locked away. What day is this? It's Sunday. I need a more specific answer, please. Say that a little bit. Say that a little bit. I know I know what today is. But what day is this reading from, right? On that evening, on that day, when it was evening, the first day of the week, the disciples were locked in a room. And I heard Miss Nancy say the answer. She needs to say it a little bit louder. Second Sunday. Oh, I didn't hear the first part of that. It's Easter. This is Easter Day. This reading happens on Easter Day. When it was evening on that day. Because back up 18 verses. And what do we get? On the morning of that day, Mary Magdalene went to the garden to the tomb. Expecting to find what? The rock still there and Jesus dead. And she didn't. And she ran and told the disciples and Peter and John came and they peeked in and they looked and they saw that it was empty and they went home and told nobody nothing. And then that evening, they're locked away in the room. Why? For fear of the Jews, because they just killed our teacher. So they're going to do probably the same to us. So they're right to be afraid. But who wasn't there? Thomas. Doubting Thomas, right? This is Doubting Thomas Sunday, right? Doubting Thomas. Wasn't locked in the room with the other ten, right? Why are there only ten? Because Judas is dead. So there's 10 of them in the room. Thomas is somewhere else. Where is Thomas? See, it'd be good. He's sitting right there. (laughs) We don't know where Thomas is, right? We can assume we our assumption would be is that he's someplace hiding by himself that he didn't get caught up with the other ten. He couldn't get into the room with them, so he's somewhere hiding by himself. Or maybe he actually gets it and he's out talking to people about Jesus. But we don't get that from later on, right? Because Jesus comes into the room and looks at the disciples and he says to them, peace be with you. And what do they do? They probably look at him a lot like you're looking at me right now. Who are you and what are you talking about? What's going on here? What's happening, right? Jesus then had to step forward. Did you hear that in the reading? Did you hear that? Jesus comes into the room and he says, Peace be with you. After this, he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples rejoiced. They didn't get it from Jesus. The person who they had been living with and walking with and doing ministry with for three years... Came and stood among them, and they didn't know who he was. And he, and he gave them peace, and then he had to show them his hands, the mark of the nails, and his side. And then they knew who he was, and then they rejoiced. So why does Thomas get a bad rap when he asked for the exact same thing that the other ten got? Did you ever think about that before? Thomas just says, I'm not going to believe unless I can see the marks in his hands and the mark in his side. And that's exactly what the other ten had already gotten. Right? Right? How many of us would love Jesus to come and stand in the midst of this room right now and show us his hands and his side so that we could actually believe that this is true? I got one hand. I would, many of us would probably be completely terrified if somebody just like appeared out of nowhere in the middle of this room. Right? And would we actually still believe even better? Or could it be an optical illusion? Right? Because um, David Copperfield, how many of you know who David Copperfield is? Right? How many people should still know who he is? He's a pretty famous magician, right? He made the Statue of Liberty disappear. 
I saw it on television. I watched him do it. I don't believe the Statue of Liberty disappeared. I don't believe it was a hoax from the TV station. I believe in some way he did an optical illusion which made it appear that the Statue of Liberty was no longer there. I saw it. But I didn't believe it. It was amazing. But I didn't believe it. Because I can see all sorts of things that, that aren't necessarily true. Right? Optical illusions of all kinds are out there. You know, you've seen those things where they have a black box with a white square in the middle of it, and then they have a white square with a black box in the middle of it, and one of them looks bigger than the other, but they're both exactly the same size because it's the way that it's shaded and the way that you're looking at it, that one looks bigger than the other. It's an optical illusion. It's not true. But yet your brain is telling you that these things are true. Seeing isn't always believing. And it's not about doubting. You see, Jesus stepped into that room the next week, which would be today, right? He came back to the room where the eleven were gathered together and he stood amongst them and he said again to them, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, come and see the holes, come and see my side, put your hands in, stop. What did he say? Doubting. Doubting. But believe. Is that actually what he said? Is that what he said? Do not doubt, but believe. Is that what he said? That's what what? That's what your translation says. Thomas was a pistos. A pistos. Pistos. Ask my wife what pistos is. No, don't ask her right now. Pistos is one of the very first words as, as a seminarian you learn in summer Greek. Pistos. It's a word that's all throughout the Bible. It's a word that I've talked about several times but never actually said what the word was. Right? Jesus said to him, do not apistos but apistos. Do not apistos but pistos. Excuse me. Do not apistos but pistos. And, and now I know you're all looking at me like, what in the heck does that mean? Ah, or a, in the Greek, means a negative, right? So, do not apistos, do not be unpistoing, but pisto. Pistos is a word in Greek that means faith, or trust, or believe. So when Jesus says to him, do not be untrusting, but trust. Do not be unfaithful, but faithful. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. You see, Thomas, or more to the point, the people that translated this, this passage, give doubting a bad rap. They make it sound like it's bad to doubt things. And it's not. What happens when you doubt something normally? You, you, say that a little bit louder. You search, you search out an answer. You look for, for, for confirmation. You look for an understanding to what's going on. Doubt leads us to question. Doubt leads us to better understanding. Doubt leads us to research. Doubt leads us to, to look into matters. Jesus said to Thomas, don't be unbelieving. Right? Like the, like the person in Mark that comes to Jesus and says, I believe, help my unbelief. It's not that I, that I am not questioning. I just can't, I can't, I can't do it on my own. Right? It's not about questioning Jesus. It's not about looking for answers. It's about understanding exactly who Jesus is and what He's done for us. Jesus says the same things to you. Do not be unbelieving, but believe. Question all you want. And know that I'm always going to be there to help you through those questions. 
question all you need to and know that I'm going to walk with you through the doubt and the struggle and the things that you're going through. Question all you need to and know that those answers are going to come. Why are they going to come? Because of what John said here at the end, right? This is actually the last chapter of the Gospel of John. And if you were looking at your Bible, you would say, um, Pastor, there's a chapter 21. Um, somebody added that a little bit later. Actually, the ending here is actually the ending to, gospel, to the Gospel of John. And those last two verses, right, which seem to be stuck on there. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, in the Gospel of John. But these are written. Why are they written? So that you may come to believe. And who is you? Who is you? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if it's all y'all or y'all. I don't I didn't look that one up, so. But either way, it doesn't matter. It's you. The stuff that John wrote in this book, he wrote it for a purpose. He wrote it because these are the things that he knew would help all of us know that seeing isn't believing, and we don't need to see Jesus because we've been told what has happened. And these are the things that are written here so that we can understand what God has done for us and that we can come to believe. And that's exactly what John is saying here, right, to Thomas. Don't be unbelieving, but believe. Because all of these things that are written in this book are true. And they're written so that you can understand what Jesus did for you. We don't need anything else. Jesus did a lot of other things, but you don't need to worry about that. All you need to know is what he's done for you. And just believe it. So believe that Jesus died on the cross. That he had nails driven through his hands and his feet. That he suffered a painful, anguishing death. And rose again from the dead. That the tomb couldn't hold him. And he rose, and he's seated at the right hand of God the Father, and he did all of that because of how much he loves you. And he would do it again, just for you. Believe what you've been told, and know that in the faces of those sitting next to you, you can see our risen Savior, because he's alive in each and every one of us. Because he gave us his spirit. He gave us the spirit of God. That spirit which created life. That spirit which made dry bones walk. That spirit that still lives and flies throughout all of our lives. Surrounds us. I almost went into a Star Wars quote there. It surrounds us. It penetrates us. And it binds the church together. Right? The spirit that Jesus gave to his disciples lives in you and is sending you out into the world to share his love with everyone. So believe and go and do what he's called you to do.